All right, uh, maybe we can go ahead and get started. So the plan for today is to, uh, to cover reinforcement learning. So this is going to be basically the, the last uh, kind of technical topic uh, that we cover in this course. So in the previous lecture, we talked about imitation learning, uh, which is this idea that you collect some demonstrations, some kind of expert data uh, from a human, uh, and then you learn a, a neural network uh, that basically tries to mimic what the human is doing. And you can apply this in the context of driving, for instance, like lane following uh, by mapping a neural network uh, from images that your robot car observes uh, to control inputs in the form of uh, steering uh, to mimic uh, basically what you saw the, the human doing. Uh, and we saw this kind of working in, in practice uh, for uh, uh, an autonomous uh, vehicle example. So this is urban uh, driving uh, in, uh, in the UK uh, using uh, imitation learning. And it works pretty well, right? It's a little bit kind of uh, jerky, like the steering motion, uh, but overall uh, it kind of mostly does the, the right uh, thing. Um, so I guess one challenge with uh, imitation learning uh, is that we're somehow like inherently limited uh, in terms of what we can achieve uh, by the demonstrations that we were provided by the human. Uh, right? So we're ultimately just trying to mimic what the human is doing. We're not really going beyond um, what the, the human has uh, shown us how to do. Uh, so one, I think, kind of natural follow-on question is, can we automatically uh, discover strategies uh, that are potentially better uh, than just uh, mimicking what the, the human is showing us how to do? Uh, so that's where reinforcement learning comes in. Uh, so I guess to give you the, the kind of uh, basic idea behind uh, reinforcement learning, uh, here's a, a video uh, of reinforcement learning kind of working uh, in practice in a simulator. Uh, so the, the goal here is pretty simple. Uh, so the car uh, needs to park itself in the kind of red uh, rectangle that you see in the bottom left of the, the video. Uh, and what's going on here is that the car tries something uh, and it's given a penalty or a reward. Uh, so if it gets close to the, uh, the parking spot, it gets a, a kind of higher reward. Uh, if it crashes into something, then it gets a penalty. So you can think of that as a, as a negative reward. Uh, and it, it, this is basically trial and error learning, right? So it tries something, uh, it gets a reward. It tries something else, it uh, gets a reward. Uh, and it tries all sorts of crazy things, as you can, as you can see. Uh, in the beginning, it's kind of very random. It like crashes into all the other cars. It crashes into uh, everything, uh, and yeah, this process keeps going. So this is attempt number nine. I'm not going to play the whole video. It's very long, uh, but yeah, let's maybe skip ahead. So it's still struggling. Attempt twenty thousand. Uh, it starts doing something kind of reasonable. Like at least it gets to the vicinity of the the red uh, parking spot, but then it overshoots. Uh, and then, yeah, we keep going. So this is at time 50,000. It's still uh, still learning. Uh, all right, so 200,000 attempts. And it's, yeah, it's, it's, still, it's still going. I'm going to skip right to the end here. So uh, 310,000 attempts. Uh, and it learns how to, how to park itself. Uh, and it actually does it so that the final performance is, is relatively uh, impressive, like it's able to actually, uh, so maybe, let me just play that little clip over there. Uh, so from different initial conditions, it's able to, to park itself. Uh, and I think, yeah, so this one, it like turns and backs up um, and it parks itself like pretty quickly. And then this one, uh, one of the, the ones, it kind of, uh, yeah, backs up like that and then turns and, and parks. Uh, so that the final performance after this kind of trial and error uh, learning process, uh, is actually fairly uh, robust to initial uh, conditions. So here it does like a kind of k-turn and it parks itself. All right, so I guess that's uh, the, the basic idea behind reinforcement learning. Uh, so in reinforcement learning, we have some robot. Uh, so in the RL literature, this is typically called the, the agent uh, that's interacting with some environment. Uh, the environment and the agent, the environment and the robot have some state. Uh, so the state, uh, I guess here we're using the notation from our feedback control lectures. So xt is the state, ut is the control input. So the, uh, at any given time, there is some state for the robot and the environment. Uh, the robot takes a control input, um, and there's a new state. Uh, and there's some cost or reward uh, that the environment gives to the robot. Uh, and that's basically the, the main kind of signal uh, that the robot is trying to minimize if we're thinking about uh, cost functions. Uh, so the goal is to learn some controller, so some mapping from uh, states or the robot sensor observations 
uh, to actions that will minimize uh, the cost uh, that you're getting from the, the environment. Uh, so yeah, I guess as the, the video showed, so RL is basically about doing uh, kind of trial and error. Uh, so we're going to parameterize uh, some controller, some feedback controller, uh, some mapping from states or operations to, to actions using a neural network, for instance. Uh, and then we're basically going to tune uh, the weights of the neural network. We're going to tune the, the controller uh, to try to minimize costs. Um, so uh, I guess I, I showed you kind of a, a slightly silly video just to uh, show you uh, how RL works uh, at a high level. Uh, but over the last few years, there's been a, uh, a lot of progress in RL. Um, so uh, I guess about eight or so years ago, uh, uh, there was a lot of progress on using RL to solve uh, video games. So these are uh, Atari uh, games, like old Atari games. Uh, and uh, this is showing, uh, um, yeah, basically using, let me skip to the, the end here again. Yeah, using like reinforcement learning to, to learn how to uh, play these uh, these video games, and, and you can get uh, kind of like superhuman uh, performance on on many of these uh, tasks. Uh, I guess another really famous example uh, around six years ago, 2016, uh, is the AlphaGo system. Uh, so this was from DeepMind. Uh, so they famously uh, beat the the world uh, champion at Go, uh, Lisa Dole, uh, back in uh, in early uh, 2016, uh, using some deep reinforcement learning techniques. Uh, and in the robotics uh, kind of community, there's also been uh, a lot of excitement around uh, deep reinforcement learning. So this is an example uh, from uh, Google. Uh, so this is their ARM farm, uh, where they had uh, a bunch of robots, I think about 14 or so uh, robotic manipulators uh, that are basically learning to grasp uh, using reinforcement learning. And again, the basic idea is the same. So initially, uh, you start off just trying random things. Uh, you see how well you perform. Uh, and then over time, you try to maximize the reward. So the reward here uh, corresponds to uh, success. So I guess a reward of one if you pick up something, and uh, let's say a reward of zero if you, if you don't uh, pick something up. Uh, and after lots of trials, you, you can get uh, uh, really good at, uh, at grasping. So uh, I forget what the exact success rates were for, for this one, but yeah, nowadays, uh, for these kinds of uh, objects, you can get uh, somewhere between 95 and maybe 98 percent success rates. Uh, and yeah, I guess a lot of these objects are, were not seen during training. So during training time, uh, you use trial and error uh, on a particular set of objects. And then at test time, test time you deploy it uh, on objects that, that you haven't seen before. Uh, and you can see it doing some relatively, it's like learn to do some relatively clever things. Maybe if I go back. Over here, so over here, it kind of like separates the uh, the objects and, and picks up the, the yellow one, um, and it's able to pick up uh, flexible, uh, so like non-rigid uh, objects as well, uh, which is uh, has been kind of uh, traditionally challenging for uh, more like model-based uh, techniques for for grasping. Uh, let me see if there's more. I guess some interesting ones here. Yeah, so it basically is able to uh, learn to, to grasp. A pretty diverse set of, uh, of different uh, objects using the enforcement learning. Um, and even more recently, so the last uh, two or three years or so, um, uh, there's been a kind of resurgence of interest in, in using deep reinforcement learning for uh, locomotion. Uh, so this is uh, from Marco uh, Hutter's group uh, at Zurich, uh, where they're using deep reinforcement learning uh, to train uh, quadrupedal robots uh, and also some bipedal robots uh, to uh, to walk over different kinds of uh, terrain, uh, and this is yeah this is in in simulation uh, that the, the training is, is happening. Um, yeah, so they're like simulating lots and lots of different robots that are all kind of going through this uh, trial and error uh, process uh, with uh, with different uh, terrains, and then ultimately they deploy uh, the learned controller um, on the, the real uh, hardware system. So this is the, the animal uh, quadrupedal uh, robot that, uh, that that group uh, developed. And you can see that it's like pretty good, right? Uh, so it's able to, uh, to walk over different uh, terrains, uh, navigate through different spaces, uh, climb over different, uh, different objects, um, all through this uh, kind of end uh, product. This is the end product of, of the, the reinforcement learning. Process. So we're actually going to spend uh, a, a bunch of time uh, looking at this paper in particular, uh, figuring out uh, what were the, the ingredients uh, to make it work, uh, I guess once we've covered some of the, the basic math uh, behind RL. Uh, so I guess some, some more uh, general comments on, on RL. Uh, so reinforcement learning is generally much more challenging uh, than uh, supervised learning. 
uh, for a number of reasons. So in supervised learning, the data uh, that we're learning from uh, is basically provided to us. So we have some fixed, like static data set, like ImageNet, for example, uh, and that's just uh, given to us. In reinforcement learning, we are uh, collecting data. So the robot is kind of actively influencing uh, the data that it sees. Uh, so it's trying something out uh, in a simulator or out in the, the real world. Uh, and that influences the, the data that it collects. Uh, and small kind of changes uh, to the robot's actions uh, can have pretty drastic impacts on the future uh, data that it sees. And the future data is what it's using to, to learn. Uh, and so, uh, so you need to basically reason about uh, the dynamics, uh, so reason about how actions uh, at the beginning of an episode uh, can propagate uh, and lead to like, drastically different, action, different outcomes in the, in the future. Uh, there's, there's also there's also this uh, problem uh, known as a credit assignment in, in reinforcement learning, uh, which is that if something went wrong, uh, figuring out exactly why it went wrong, so what uh, action maybe somewhere at the beginning of the trajectory uh, led to uh, some kind of inevitable uh, collision, maybe. Uh, so you need to figure out you need to like assign credit to, to actions uh, potentially way back uh, in the past. Uh, for outcomes that happened uh, much later in the future, and this is a, a major kind of technical uh, challenge. Uh, but I guess the, the power of, uh, of reinforcement learning, uh, deep reinforcement learning, uh, comes from what I mentioned right at the beginning of the lecture, uh, like this potential ability to discover, like automatically discover clever policies, uh, controllers, feedback controllers that are hard to uh, specific, explicitly like write down by hand. So it's kind of going through this learning process and, and discovering things that. Uh, yeah, maybe beat the, the world champion at, uh, at Go, for instance. Uh, the other, I guess, major kind of appealing feature of uh, deep reinforcement learning, uh, so I guess the, the term deep here just means that there's neural networks, uh, deep neural networks that we're using uh, somehow for, for reinforcement learning, and exactly how uh, depends on the specific method, and, and we'll get into that. Uh, but yeah, I guess one of the, the really exciting things uh, about re deep reinforcement learning is the ability to handle rich sensory inputs. So if, you have, if your robot has uh, vision or depth, so these are like pretty high dimensional uh, sensory observations that your robot is getting, uh, turning that into representations that you can then uh, use to, uh, to plan and, and, and uh, select actions. Uh, that's one of the, the kind of really powerful things about uh, DeepRL. Um, in practice, uh, to apply deep reinforcement learning, uh, you either need a, a good simulator, uh, so I guess as we saw in the, the video, this trial and error learning process can take lots and lots of time, lots and lots of iterations. Uh, and while the robot is learning, it could do uh, really silly things. Uh, so you need uh, potentially a good simulator uh, or the ability to perform lots and lots of hardware experiments. So that's what they did with the, the Google Arm Farm. They set up um, many different arms, lots of different objects, and they kind of automated the, the data collection uh, process. Uh, and that's what made uh, that uh, possible. OK, so that's the, the kind of high level uh, overview of, uh, of deep reinforcement learning. Any, any questions on, on that? OK, so let's start trying to, to formalize uh, this idea of, uh, of reinforcement learning. Uh, the main kind of technical, uh, I guess, concept uh, that uh, RL works with uh, is what's known as a Markov decision process, uh, MDP. Um, so, the notation we're going to use in, in just, I guess, today's lecture uh, is going to be consistent with the literature on RL, uh, which uses a, a slightly different set of conventions than uh, the people in, in feedback control do. Uh, the meanings are kind of the, the same, but the, the letters that, that uh, people use in, in RL are different. Uh, so we're going to use ST uh, to denote the state of the robot and its environment uh, at time step uh, T. Uh, and we're going to use AT uh, to denote the, uh, the action. Um, so previously, when we talked about feedback control, and I guess most of the, the course, uh, we used uh, XT as our state, uh, UT as our control input. Uh, the meanings are identical, just the uh, symbols are going to be different uh, to be consistent with the, the RL literature. So ST, state, uh, AT, control input, uh, or, or action. Um, so a Markov decision process, uh, MDP, uh, is specified by some state space, so that's something we're already familiar with from feedback control. Some action space, so this is our control input space, also familiar from feedback control. Uh, some dynamics, uh, potentially probabilistic dynamics, uh, which is also familiar uh, from when we talked about um, uh, 
uh, Bayesian uh, filtering, particle filtering, all of that. So this is uh, exactly that. So this assigns the probability uh, of the state being uh, equal to, uh, or like the likelihood of uh, st plus one, uh, given the, the previous state st and the control input, the action that the robot took, uh, at. Uh, and we have some distribution over initial states, so P of uh, S0. Uh, the, so I guess everything above this reward function uh, is familiar to us from when we talked about uh, Bayesian filtering, right? dynamics model, uh, distribution over initial states, uh, state space, action space. Uh, the one, uh, I guess, new thing uh, when we're defining a Markov decision process is the reward function. Uh, so this is analogous to the, the cost function, uh, which we saw when we talked about LQR. Uh, you can think of the reward as just the negation of the cost. Uh, so I guess RL people are maybe more optimistic. They think about uh, rewards uh, rather than, uh, than costs. Uh, but it's the, the same basic idea. So uh, your robot gets some reward. So this is a, a scalar, uh, typically non-negative uh, uh, reward. Uh, that's a function of the state uh, at time t, st, and the control input, like the action uh, at. Um, so I guess with that setup, any any questions on on the uh, oops, sorry on the setup here? Okay, so yeah, with that setup, our goal is to find some policy. Uh, so again, the, the term policy uh, is just a feedback controller, and this is another one of the things where there's a distinction uh, in the terminology between feedback control and RL. Uh, so I'm going to try to stay consistent with the uh, the RL uh, terminology. So I'll say uh, policy. Uh, but yeah, you can think of it as a feedback controller. Uh, so our goal is to, to find a policy that maximizes the expected reward over some uh, time, given time uh, horizon. Uh, we're going to work, I guess, for some technical reasons with uh, stochastic policies. Um, so this is a distribution uh, over actions. So at any particular state, uh, the policy is going to map that state to a distribution over uh, control inputs rather than like a deterministic uh, choice of, uh, of uh, action. Uh, and yeah, I guess this is for some technical reasons that we'll uh, get into a little bit uh, later. Um, so formally, uh, the objective in reinforced learning uh, is to find some policy, so find some pi uh, that maximizes the cumulative expected reward. So summation <laughs> over zero to some capital T, that's our time horizon. Uh, potentially t could actually be infinity, so an infinite uh, time horizon. Uh, we're uh, summing up the expected reward uh, at the, the different um, uh, time steps. Uh, and the randomness here uh, comes from uh, two places. Uh, so one is because we have probabilistic dynamics. Uh, so given a state and an action, uh, we have a distribution over the future states. Uh, and uh, we have a stochastic policy, so given a particular state, the choice of actions is, uh, is random. Um, there's a slightly different version that's uh, sometimes kind of convenient to look at, uh, which is a discounted uh, version. Uh, so everything is kind of identical here, uh, uh, except that we have a, a gamma to the t uh, that's inside the summation, and gamma is some uh, uh, scalar uh, that's less than or, or equal to 1. Uh, and basically what this is doing is setting an effective time horizon. Uh, so typically you use uh, discounts uh, for cases where the time horizon, uh, the capital T, is infinite. Uh, so what this is saying is that uh, for short t, for small t, uh, uh, care more about the, the reward. So uh, when t is small, uh, gamma to the t is something that's close to 1. So when t is large, uh, gamma to the t uh, is something that's small. Uh, so this is uh, more heavily weighing rewards that are uh, in the near future, uh, less heavily weighing uh, rewards that are far away. Uh, we're not going to do too much with the discounted version, but yeah, I guess it's good to know about since uh, it's often used in practice. Uh, any questions on the formal kind of problem setup, uh, what we're trying to do in, in RL? All right. Uh, there's a, a different variant as well, uh, partially observable uh, Markov decision process, or, or PMDP. Uh, so this is the same setup as a MDP. Uh, with the exception that we don't get to observe the true state. Uh, so with an MDP, the, the policy is a function of the, the state. Uh, with the PAMDP, uh, we don't get to see the, the true state. What we get is some observation. Uh, and again, this is something that we're familiar with. So when we talked about Bayesian filtering, we had an observation model, a sensor model. Uh, so that's uh, exactly uh, what, what uh, this is. 
Uh, in the reinforcement learning literature, uh, this kind of distinction between MDPs and PAMDPs is sometimes uh, ignored uh, or not yeah, paid uh, that much attention to. Uh, and people often think about some sequence of observations, so some sequence of images, let's say, that your robot is getting uh, as corresponding to the state. Uh, and then you kind of forget about the fact that there's, uh, there's uh, uh, partial uh, observability just by saying that what I, whatever I'm actually observing, like the sequence of uh, observations from my camera, uh, I'm just going to treat that as a state and I'm going to pretend uh, like I have a, a Markov uh, decision process. Uh, so I guess that's what we're going to do in, in this lecture. We're not going to uh, think that much about the partially observable case. We're just going to assume that we have access to the state. And in principle, the state could be something high dimensional, uh, like images that your robot is getting, uh, or a sequence of images uh, from, from like kind of previous uh, time steps. All right. Um, so I guess I think it's useful to, to just think through uh, what I described here with the MDP uh, and connect it back to our feedback control uh, lectures. So when we discussed optimal control, uh, specifically when we discussed LQR, uh, the setup was very, very similar. Right? We had some dynamics, linear dynamics. We had some uh, cost function, so analogous to the reward. Uh, and we were trying to find some policy, some feedback controller, some mapping from states to actions. Uh, that minimizes the, the costs. Uh, here we're maximizing the rewards, but it's, it's kind of the, the same basic uh, idea. Uh, one sort of uh, distinction in terms of uh, emphasis in, in reinforcement learning uh, has to do with whether or not we assume direct knowledge of the dynamics of the system. Uh, so in reinforcement learning, I guess there are many variants of, of RL, uh, but often uh, the focus is on coming up with algorithms that don't uh, require explicit knowledge of the dynamics. So don't require like an explicit form uh, for P of uh, ST plus 1 given ST80. Um, so that's, that's what we're going to do in, in this lecture. So we're going to develop a, a model-free uh, reinforcement learning uh, algorithm. Uh, so there's still some actual dynamics. We're just going to not assume knowledge uh, to the dynamics. Um, so yeah, I guess the, the main assumption then, uh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, why would you do that? Um, so part of the motivation uh, is to do reinforcement learning in hardware. So I think that the clearest maybe justification is if you're doing reinforcement learning on the actual hardware system, uh, then it's a kind of convenient assumption to make that you don't have explicit knowledge of the dynamics um, because um, yeah, you're, you're basically like, you don't then have to like come up with a dynamics model for your hardware system. You're just going to like try things out, uh, see how things perform, and then kind of tweak your policy uh, to, to improve the, the reward. Um, but yeah, so there's a, I think that, that that's the, the main kind of uh, justification. Often people don't do that. Like people do reinforcement learning in simulation. Uh, and so as soon as you have a simulator, uh, you have a model because someone wrote the simulator, uh, and the simulator is kind of explicitly like simulating the, the dynamics of the system. Uh, and there, the justification is not as clear. Uh, um, and there are like other, I guess, techniques that, that uh, also are like justified, like beyond like model-free uh, techniques, uh, like model-based reinforcement learning techniques are, are justified if, if things are in sim. But uh, yeah, I think there's a kind of, um, it's a slightly like weird thing in the, the community. Like people often apply model-free reinforcement learning techniques in a simulator uh, and sort of pretend like they don't have a model, but it's in sim, uh, and so there must be a model because someone wrote the, the sim, uh, and that's a, it's a bit of a, a disconnect. Uh, question? Yeah, I'm wondering, uh, are there business systems that are just too complex to model? Uh, I think that like yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah, I think, like I said, the, the clear justification is when the, the true dynamics are, are really hard to model. So you have some like fluid dynamics or uh, like contact is, is often like pretty hard to, to model. Uh, and if you're doing learning uh, on hardware, uh, then it makes sense. Like then, like you're not explicitly coming out with the model. But, uh, but yeah, often that's not what people do. People do it in, in sim. Um, so it's still valid, right? I mean, you can apply like a model free, you can like ignore the fact that uh, the simulator um, has encoded as part of it like the dynamics. You can ignore that and just apply a, 
a model-free technique, and, and that's often what people do. I guess partly it's just like kind of convenience. Uh, partly also it's that the, the simulator could be pretty complicated. Um, so writing down uh, kind of explicitly, um, sorry, where did it go? Yeah, writing down explicitly uh, like this probabilistic model, even with a simulator, uh, could be uh, just annoying to do or, or a little bit challenging. Uh, so yeah, partly it's a kind of a convenience thing. Uh, good questions. Other questions? Go ahead. Yeah, so simulators, um, they're often based on kind of first principles, uh, or mostly based on first principles with some uh, augmentation, like some maybe components that are uh, learned from, from data. Um, but yeah, I guess the, the most like popular uh, like simulators that people use in reinforcement learning are, yeah, it's kind of like physics-based physics uh, uh, simulation, not, uh, or at least the, the kind of equations are not learned. Like the parameters uh, could be learned, uh, from from like real data, but uh, uh, yeah, it's not like we're learning f equals ma. Like those those things are like the equations of motion are uh, like derived from uh, from physics. Yeah. All right. So so yeah, I'm going to switch to the uh, the blackboard. Uh, so the specific approach that we're going to look at uh, is what's known as policy gradient. Uh, so I'm going to describe the, the most kind of basic version of policy gradient. Uh, I'll point you to some extensions that are used in practice. And then, yeah, like I said, we'll think about uh, all the different uh, tricks uh, that you need to use uh, to actually make uh, this stuff work in practice for uh, robotic systems. Uh, so the high-level strategy uh, behind uh, policy gradient uh, is pretty straightforward. It's basically what was illustrated in that kind of car uh, video. Uh, so we're going to start by choosing some policy. So policy, again, is just a, a stochastic mapping from states to uh, control inputs. Uh, we're going to call that pi theta. Uh, and you should think of this as a neural network uh, parameterized by weights. Uh, theta. Uh, and so the, the output of the neural network uh, is a distribution over actions, so distribution over control inputs. Uh, if you have finite number of actions, uh, then you can think of the, the output of the, the network uh, as being a discrete probability vector, uh, so a vector that, uh, that sums to 1 and is uh, between each element is between 0 and 1. Uh, if you have continuous actions, then you can think of the uh, policy as outputting uh, some parameters of a distribution. So let's say a Gaussian distribution uh, on control inputs. Uh, and the input is, is the, the state. So maybe let me just write it down again. So pi theta assigns some probability or likelihood uh, to actions uh, for any given uh, state. So yeah, we randomly maybe select some, uh, some policy, uh, some neural network parameters, theta. Uh, and then we're going to estimate the gradient of the thing that we're trying to maximize. So the thing that we're trying to maximize is the expected uh, cumulative uh, reward. Uh, so we're going to estimate the gradient uh, of the expected uh, cumulative reward. Uh, and this is the, the gradient uh, with respect to our neural network uh, parameters. Uh, and then we're just going to do a gradient ascent. Uh, so we're trying to maximize the, the expected reward. Uh, so it's gradient ascent instead of gradient uh, descent. Uh, so we're just going to update our parameters theta in the direction of the estimated uh, gradient. Uh, and we're going to keep doing this. So we're going to try uh, running this policy. We're going to see what happens. Uh, based on what happens, we're somehow going to estimate this uh, gradient. Uh, and then we're just going to take a step in the direction of the gradient. And we're going to keep doing this until uh, we hopefully converge to, to something that's good. 
Uh, I guess any questions on the, the high level uh, strategy here? Go ahead. Yeah, it's a vector of weights, exactly, yeah. So theta is what is parameterizing the policy. Uh, so if I give you a particular setting for the weights, theta, uh, then that gives us a particular policy, so a particular mapping from states to a distribution or, or actions, yeah. Uh, so you can think of this as uh, maybe a convolutional like neural network that has a certain set of weights, uh, and just the concatenation of all the weights, uh, I'm calling that, uh, uh, that theta. Good, okay. Um, so just uh, pictorially, uh, so yeah, I guess a useful picture maybe to have in your mind uh, is that you have a particular policy uh, and you run it. So you um, uh, run it, in this case, let's say three, three different times. So this is some initial uh, state. These are three different trajectories that you get uh, from running your policy. Uh, and maybe, yeah, I guess maybe there's some slightly different uh, initial conditions. There's also stochasticity coming from the policy and stochasticity potentially in the, the dynamics of the, the system as well. Uh, and maybe you find that these two trajectories lead to high reward. Um, and this trajectory, let's say, leads to low reward. So intuitively, what we should do is increase the probability uh, of choosing uh, the actions that were chosen in these uh, trajectories. Uh, and then we decrease the, the actions uh, that were chosen uh, in, in this uh, trajectory. Uh, and the specific kind of adjustment that you make uh, is going to be based on the estimated uh, gradient uh, of our uh, expected uh, cumulative reward. Uh, and I guess just one more thing to, to emphasize. Uh, what I'm going to describe uh, is going to be model-free. So we won't assume explicit knowledge of the dynamics. So P of S T plus one given S T uh, A T. Uh, we won't assume uh, we know what it is. Of course, there is some dynamics, uh, but yeah, we're just not gonna. We're gonna assume that we, we don't know exactly what it is. Uh, we're just gonna assume uh, the ability to try things out uh, in the, the real world or in the simulator, uh, and based on our trials, uh, we're gonna try to improve the, the policy. Okay. So I guess let's. Maybe just start by uh, making this uh, observation. Um, so the probability, uh, so I'm going to subscript it with, with theta. Uh, so the joint uh, distribution over uh, states and actions. So ST, AT. Um, so if we expand this uh, joint uh, distribution out, uh, just by definition of the joint distribution, conditional distributions, uh, we get this. T minus one pi theta. So this joint distribution over uh, states and actions, uh, you can expand it out uh, into uh, the initial distribution over the state, uh, so that's P of X S0, uh, and then a, a product uh, of uh, the dynamics kind of distribution, the uh, probability uh, of ST plus one given ST80 uh, and the, uh, the policy. Um, and we're gonna use this kind of shorthand uh, notation uh, so I'm going to define uh, this uh, uh, distribution, this joint distribution. I'm going to call it P of theta uh, tau, where uh, tau is a state 
action uh, trajectory. Uh, so it's just the kind of S0, A0, uh, S1, A1, uh, all the way up to ST, uh, A, uh, T. Um, so I guess with this uh, notation, our goal is to find some optimal uh, setting of the neural network parameters or some optimal uh, policy, uh, which is just the arg max over uh, theta of our expected uh, cumulative uh, reward. Yeah, so this is just helping us uh, compress uh, notation a bit, a little bit. Uh, so tau stands for uh, trajectory, uh, and so here what we're doing is looking at uh, the expected value over the randomness uh, in trajectories. Uh, that again comes from two sources: so the randomness in the uh, dynamics, uh, and then the randomness in the, the policy. Uh, and we're looking at the expected uh, cumulative uh, reward. Uh, I guess any questions on on this notation here? All right. So one thing we can do, uh, so we're, yeah, we're trying to, to maximize this. One thing we can do uh, is estimate this expectation. Uh, by taking a bunch of samples, uh, so we can uh, approximately estimate, um, so I'm going to call this actually uh, J of theta. Uh, so for any uh, policy, uh, we have an expected reward. That's the thing we're trying to, to maximize. Uh, so this is kind of similar to uh, supervised learning, uh, where we were trying to minimize the, the training loss. Here we're trying to maximize uh, the expected reward. Uh, so we can approximately uh, calculate uh, J of theta, like this expected reward, uh, by taking a bunch of samples. Uh, t equals zero to capital T. Um, so yeah, I guess what we're doing here is we're fixing theta, uh, and then we're running the policy capital N times. Um, so we end up with capital N different uh, trajectories, so capital N different state action trajectories, uh, and we're just looking at the, the average or average uh, summed uh, reward. Uh, and that's an estimate for the thing that we're trying to, to maximize. Uh, so one thing we could do is finite differences. Uh, right? So I guess we talked about this when we talked about uh, uh, empirical risk minimization in, in supervised learning. Um, so you can perturb uh, theta in every component. Uh, you can see uh, what reward you get uh, for the kind of unperturbed version and then the perturbed version. Uh, and then you can look at the, the difference and then divide by the amount of the perturbation. Uh, and that gives you an estimate for the, the gradient. And then you can take a, a step in the direction of the gradient. Um, so I guess does that seem reasonable? Uh, maybe what are some challenges with that? Or how long, how long will that take? How many steps per, uh, like per, like to, to estimate uh, the whole kind of uh, gradient vector? So yeah, I guess the, the number of like parameters, right, uh, is really large. So theta is uh, all the weights of a neural network. Uh, so maybe millions of, uh, of parameters. Um, so to get each component of the, the gradient, uh, you need to perturb each component, uh, run your policy, uh, and then uh, look at the, the difference. Um, and yeah, you do that for, uh, for every uh, component of, of theta. So this is going to take a, a really, really long time. Uh, that's, it's not uh, particularly uh, kind of efficient or, or feasible. Um, so yeah, I guess finite differencing, uh, you can always like, try it out, but it's, it's rarely uh, uh, efficient. Uh, we're going to, I guess, not use finite differences. We're going to find a, a different way. Um, so 
So find a, a different way to estimate the gradient of theta uh, with respect to, sorry, the gradient of, uh, of j of theta. So that's the expected cumulative reward uh, with respect to, uh, to theta. Uh, and again, we're going to do this in a model-free way. Uh, so our estimate, uh, our estimation procedure is not going to assume knowledge of the dynamics of the, the system. So um, let me just make things a little bit more compact even. So J of theta, uh, we said, is the ex expectation. So we're there over the randomness in trajectories. Um, so the expected uh, cumulative reward. Uh, so I'm just going to abbreviate the cumulative reward uh, as R tau. So the reward as a function of the, the trajectory. Uh, so I'm just defining this uh, to be the summation of the rewards from 0 to capital T, uh, R, S, T, A, T. Um, so the, the gradient, uh, actually, sorry, let me just uh, write, not, write this, expand this out a bit. So by definition, the expected value uh, is the integral uh, of uh, p theta tau uh, r tau uh, d uh, tau. Um, so p theta we defined up there. So that's the joint uh, distribution over states and, and actions. Uh, so the gradient of uh, g of theta with respect to, to theta uh, is the integral uh, of the gradient P of theta tau R tau uh, D tau. Um, all right, so yeah, this is a valid expression for the, the gradient. This is the thing that, again, we're trying to estimate. Uh, once we have this estimated, then we're just going to update theta in the direction of the gradient. Um, all right, so I guess this, this term, so the gradient uh, of P of theta relative to theta, so is that something we can calculate? So if we can calculate it, then yeah, we're in, in business. Uh, we can approximate this integral via a bunch of samples and then estimate the gradient that way. Uh, but I guess, is this, is this something we can calculate given the, the setup we have? Uh, yeah. Yeah. And the dynamics are fixed. I don't know the I believe. Yeah, so just directly, um, this term uh, involves the, uh, like the, the probability uh, of like the next state given the, the previous state and the, the control uh, input. Uh, but yeah, I guess you're, you're right. So there's a way, uh, there's a, a trick basically to uh, get this which is in terms of the, the dynamics, which we're assuming we don't know, uh, to purely depend on uh, gradients with respect to the, the policy, which we, which we do know. Uh, and yeah, I guess there's a, uh, a neat trick that shows up quite a bit in, in reinforcement learning and in other contexts as well. Uh, which is known as the uh, the log trick or, or the policy gradient. Log trick. Uh, sometimes it's also known as the reinforce trick. Uh, so this reinforces the, the method. Uh, well, the, the paper, I guess, that uh, uh, first uh, used this, uh, this trick uh, to do uh, policy gradient. Um, so the trick is to write, rewrite this term, 
so the gradient uh, P of theta tau um, by first just multiplying and dividing by P of theta tau P of theta tau, so we haven't done anything yet. We're just multiplying and dividing by the, the same term. Um, and this is uh, the gradient uh, of log P of theta uh, tau. Okay, and this is from the, the chain rule. Um, so if we look at the, the gradient uh, of the log of P of theta tau, uh, so if we use the, the chain rule, so that's one over P of theta tau uh, multiplied by the, the gradient uh, of P of theta tau. Uh, and that's, yeah, that's exactly uh, what we have over here. So this uh, portion over here uh, is exactly this, right, by the, the chain rule. Uh, so 1 over uh, P of theta, so that's this part, uh, multiplied by the gradient uh, of P of, P of theta. Uh, that's, uh, that's that part. Uh, I guess any, any questions on this bit of algebra here? OK. So yeah, we're, we're going to just rewrite this gradient uh, using this, this trick. So the gradient uh, of J of theta we can write as uh, P of theta gradient log uh, times R tau d tau. So we still haven't quite solved the, the problem, right? We, instead of a gradient of P of theta, we have something that looks even more complicated now, gradient of log of P of theta. So it's not clear that we've made any, any progress. But if we then expand out, uh, so I'll leave this uh, P of theta um, So we're going to plug in uh, this P of theta expression. Uh, into uh, that expression over there. Uh, so we have gradient theta, g of theta uh, is equal to p of theta uh, tau. Um, let's see. So actually, let's just look at the, the log uh, term. Uh, yeah, I guess the, the kind of complicated term is the, uh, the log uh, P of theta. So log uh, gradient theta uh, P of theta. Uh, or no, sorry, it's the other way around. So it's uh, the gradient of the, the log. Uh, so let's just actually look at the, the log. Uh, P of theta tau uh, is the log of this. Uh, so it's a log of products, uh, which becomes a, a summation. So I guess that's kind of uh, why uh, we introduced the, the log, to turn the, the products into a summation. So we have P of uh, S0, uh, or rather log of P of S0 uh, plus uh, summation. Uh, log uh, pi theta uh, plus uh, log okay and then if now if we look at the gradient uh, of log p of theta tau. Uh, so the right hand side over here, uh, the only dependence on theta is from this term. Uh, so this term over here uh, and this term over here. 
Uh, these two terms do not depend on theta. So when we take the, the gradient uh, with respect to theta, they have no contribution. Uh, so we're just left with uh, gradient uh, theta. Uh, I'll put the gradient inside the summation, so equal zero to d minus one. Uh, gradient of theta log phi theta at given s d. Right, so we're, we're almost uh, there, actually. Uh, any questions on, on this calculation? Okay. All right, so the last uh, step is to just plug in So we were trying to, yeah, so we had the, the gradient expression over there. Um, so we can rewrite this gradient expression, so gradient of, uh, of g of theta. Uh, maybe I'll call this equation one. I'll call this two. Uh, so gradient of g of theta uh, is the expected value, so this is just from equation one, so it's the expected value uh, of uh, gradient theta log e of theta times the reward. Right, so I'm just rewriting this integral as an expectation. Uh, so it's an expectation because we have uh, the product of a probability, some times some something. Uh, so we just end up with the, the expect expectation of that uh, something. Uh, and the gradient term uh, we've calculated uh, over here. So we can just plug that in. Oops. Sorry. So gradient uh, log p of theta. Uh, is the summation of gradient theta log uh, pi of theta uh, s t plus one given s t eighty uh, times the the reward. Data here is just the expectation. Okay, so I guess what have we done? Uh, the main thing that we've done is turned the gradient uh, of p of theta, uh, which we had uh, up there. Uh, so it was gradient of log of p of theta and gradient of p of theta over there uh, into a gradient of something that just involves the policy. Right, so the policy is something that we are explicitly writing. So we're writing it down as a neural network. Uh, and so we can actually calculate uh, what this uh, gradient is using uh, automatic differentiation, for example, the kinds of techniques used in the, the previous uh, assignment. Uh, so everything here, so maybe I'll actually just uh, write this down slightly more explicitly. So the reward term is just the summation of our uh, st80. Uh, so this expectation we can uh, approximate via sampling. Uh, so we can run our policy a bunch of times, let's say capital N times, uh, and just average um, this. So 1 over n, uh, and then i equals uh, 1 through n uh, of this uh, term over here.
Yeah, and the, the cool thing over here is that everything on this right hand side uh, is explicitly computable uh, via just SAP way question. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I, I don't know why. It's, yeah. Uh, where did I start doing that? Thank you. Uh, yeah. Oh, this is, sorry, this is still, yes, it's just over here. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I don't know why I did that. Yeah, so it's just a distribution over actions given the, the current state. Uh, so because we're parameterizing the, the policy using a neural network, again, this, this term is explicitly computable. We can take the, the gradient of the log. Uh, and this term over here, and actually let me just index with uh, i's uh, since we're sampling over here. Uh, so if we run the policy capital N times, uh, we end up with capital N different state action trajectories. These are like yeah, explicit values for states and actions over uh, time zero to, to capital T. Uh, so we can calculate what this is. We can calculate what this is. Uh, we can just take the, the empirical average over here. Uh, and that's our estimate for the, the gradient. And again, I'll emphasize that this is model free in the sense that nothing over here is assuming knowledge, like explicit knowledge of the dynamics of the system, right? We're just taking the gradient with respect to the policy, uh, and over here, uh, we're just looking at the rewards uh, that the robot is getting from the environment. Uh, and yeah, nothing over here uh, requires knowledge of P of ST plus one given ST uh, 18. Okay, so yeah, I guess that's the, that was kind of the, the complicated part, like finding a, a nice way to estimate the policy gradient. Once we've estimated the policy gradient, we can just apply gradient ascent. So uh, the reinforce, this is just the, the name of the algorithm uh, from the paper that uh, first uh, kind of used this idea. So reinforce policy gradient. Um, so the first step is you sample a bunch of uh, trajectories, so capital N of them, using your current policy, phi theta. Uh, the second step is estimate the gradient. Uh, using that, uh, where did it go? I guess that equation up there. So give this a, a name, so let's call this equation three. So using equation three. Uh, and then you just take a, a step. So you update theta. Uh, as theta plus uh, some lambda, so that's going to be our learning rate, uh, times the, the estimated uh, gradient. Um, uh, and that's pretty much it. So lambda is some parameter that we choose. It's the, the learning rate. Uh, so it's analogous to the, the learning rate in stochastic gradient descent. It's basically uh, setting how large of a step you take. Uh, in every update uh, for uh, for theta. Um, all right. I guess any any questions on the, the algorithm or the uh, the algebra? All right. Um, one I guess important uh, sort of implementation, um, or maybe just one important observation, uh, is that the learning rate uh, can have a really large impact on whether or not this algorithm works well in in practice. Uh, so if you choose a learning rate that's very small, uh, then it's just going to take a, a while for your uh, policy to converge to, to something good. Uh, if you set it to be too large, um, then you might take a, a step in the well, policy parameter space 
uh, that ends up leading to a policy that's very bad. Uh, and it might be impossible to recover from that. Uh, and the, the reason is in uh, reinforcement learning, uh, the data that you see, uh, which allows you to estimate what this uh, gradient is, uh, is influenced by the, the policy, right? So these trajectories uh, over here uh, that we're using to estimate the gradient, uh, those trajectories themselves depend on the policy. Uh, so if you have a bad policy, you might just end up seeing trajectories that are kind of useless uh, in terms of estimating uh, the gradient, uh, and you might not be able to recover from that. So if you end up with one bad policy, uh, you might be stuck with that bad policy kind of forever, uh, and the reinforcement learning algorithm is not going to, to converge uh, to something good. So in practice, there are a number of uh, variants uh, of this kind of reinforced policy variant algorithm that people use in practice. Uh, and the basic idea is to take steps that are large enough to, to make progress in terms of uh, maximizing the reward, uh, but not so large uh, that you're kind of just completely messing up uh, what the, uh, the policy is. Um, so, yeah, I guess I won't go into the, the kind of uh, details of, uh, of that. Uh, I'll just mention um, a variant that is maybe the most uh, popular, at least right now. Uh, so it's called proximal uh, policy optimization. So it was developed at uh, OpenAI, uh, I think in 2017. Uh, and yeah, it's still, I guess, uh, uh, probably the, the most popular uh, variant of, uh, of uh, policy gradient uh, that people use in, uh, in practice. Uh, and the, the basic idea is that it controls the step size. Uh, and prevents uh, the policy from being updated uh, too much, but at the same time, like you need to update it, of course, uh, enough to, uh, to actually learn uh, a good policy. So, all right, I guess any, any uh, questions on the, the theory before we talk about some of the implementation aspects? Uh, all right, okay. All right, so uh, this variant that I mentioned, uh, PPO, Proximal Policy Optimization, uh, has been used for uh, a lot of different uh, applications. Uh, so in robotics, uh, I'm, I'm just going to highlight a, a couple of them. Um, so this is a, a group from, uh, from Berkeley, uh, Kaushal Srinath uh, and, uh, and uh, collaborators, uh, where they used uh, PPO uh, to train in uh, simulation uh, a walking uh, policy for the CASI uh, bipedal robot. Uh, and then they were kind of running this on the uh, on the actual uh, hardware. Uh, I think they took it outdoors at some point. I won't play the whole video. All right, there we go. Uh, and the other paper that I mentioned, uh, this is from uh, Marco Hutter's group at the ETH Zurich. Uh, let me actually just play the whole uh, video and then we're going to talk about different aspects of it.
And, and again, this was using uh, PPO, like this, this variant of uh, a policy gradient that, that I uh, mentioned. Um, so there's a bunch of other uh, kind of approaches as well that we're not going to uh, have time to, to go through. Uh, so model-based reinforcement learning, that's actually something that we're already familiar with. So when we talk about feedback control, motion planning, uh, things that assume knowledge of the, the dynamics of the system, uh, yeah, I guess that kind of class of methods is known as, uh, as model-based RL. Uh, there's a different class of me methods called uh, value-based methods, where instead of uh, trying to find the policy directly, uh, you get some estimate of the value function. Uh, so this is the uh, cumulative reward. Uh, and once you have that estimated, you can kind of back out the, the policy from that. Uh, and there's techniques that combine value-based methods with policy-based methods uh, that are known as uh, actor-critic methods. Uh, so I guess instead of in one lecture trying to bombard you with all the, the maps for all of these different techniques, uh, what I'm going to do in the last, uh, I guess, 15 minutes or so uh, is talk about some practical considerations. So if you're trying to use uh, these reinforcement learning algorithms uh, in robotics, uh, what are the, the things that, uh, that you need to do to, to make things actually work well in, in practice? Um, so we're going to look at this, uh, this paper uh, that I just showed a, a video from, uh, the locomotion uh, on the, the uh, quadrupedal robot as a kind of case study. Uh, this is the, the paper. Uh, and I guess if you're interested, they actually have open source code. So you can uh, go to their GitHub repository, uh, download their code, and, and like, play around with their uh, reinforcement learning. Uh, algorithms. Uh, yeah, as I mentioned, they, they use uh, PPO, uh, uh, proximal policy optimization, uh, which is a model-free uh, policy gradient-based uh, reinforcement learning technique. Um, the policy gradient is the part uh, I kind of described, the learning uh, rate uh, uh, adaptation part I, I, I didn't describe. Uh, in this case, uh, the so maybe just going back to the, the previous question about uh, uh, model-free versus uh, model-based. Uh, I guess one argument for using a model-free approach here uh, is that the, uh, the simulation of the dynamics is pretty complicated, right? So we're simulating contact, so the uh, legs of the robot are making and breaking contact with the, the robot, uh, and writing down some kind of really explicit model uh, for those dynamics, and then taking the gradient uh, of those dynamics uh, can be quite challenging. Uh, so in this case, it's pretty convenient to use a, a model-free uh, approach. Um, the policy here is a mapping from the robot's observations. Um, so the, the states of the, the robot, uh, and also the, the terrain uh, that the robot observes uh, to the robot's desired joint positions. And that mapping is parameterized uh, using a neural network. Uh, and there's basically four kind of ingredients uh, that uh, this paper uses to, uh, to make things work in practice. Uh, and these are uh, also kind of relevant, not just for uh, this paper and locomotion, but, but also for other uh, applications. Uh, so I'm just going to spend, I guess, one slide talking about uh, each of these things. Uh, so fast simulation on GPUs, uh, curriculum-based training, uh, reward shaping, and, and domain randomization. Uh, so the fast simulation part, uh, this paper is using uh, NVIDIA's uh, Isaac Jim, which is a relatively recent uh, simulation uh, environment. Uh, that leverages uh, GPUs. Uh, and that's not something that was uh, prevalent uh, before uh, Isaac Jim. So uh, traditionally, uh, robotic simulators uh, have not uh, kind of fully utilized uh, GPUs. Uh, it was mostly uh, CPU based. Uh, if you uh, use Isaac Jim, uh, and I guess for, for this paper in particular, uh, you can simulate uh, thousands of different robots in parallel. Uh, and that's really important uh, for reinforced learning because, I guess, as we saw, it can take lots and lots of iterations, lots of trial and error uh, to converge to a, a good uh, policy. So, yeah, I guess being able to do lots of simulations in parallel, uh, especially on GPUs, is a kind of major uh, enabler for RL. Uh, the other thing that, uh, that they use in this paper that uh, other kind of papers also use is a curriculum-based uh, training. Uh, so the idea here is that training a policy from scratch uh, on really complex terrains uh, can be pretty hard. Um, so you might just not uh, improve at all, uh, uh, like your initial uh, policy. Uh, so the idea behind a curriculum is kind of similar to a course. So uh, we don't cover RL in lecture one in, in robotics. We cover it towards the end. Uh, it's the same kind of work, uh, idea over here. So you increase the difficulty uh, of the tasks um, So in a kind of a, a game-inspired uh, fashion, so video game-inspired fashion. Um, so what they're doing here is, uh, as the robots um, get better at simpler terrains, uh, they make the 
uh, terrain is more complicated. So they basically have like, different levels, so similar to uh, a video game. Uh, and then as the, the robot gets uh, better at the simpler terrains, uh, they make it harder. Uh, and if the robot is not succeeding uh, on some terrains, uh, and then they make it simpler. Uh, and then, yeah, I guess as, as the robot learns, uh, it gets more and more, the terrains get more and more complicated. Uh, and they say that after a thousand uh, iterations of learning, the robots have reached the most challenging level uh, for all uh, terrain types and are spread uh, across the, uh, the map. Um, yeah, the other, uh, I guess, important ingredient here is the choice of the reward function. Uh, so in the, the math that I derived here, we were just saying that someone gives you a, a reward function. Uh, in practice, choosing this reward function well can be crucial to, to good performance. Uh, in principle, you can just apply policy gradient uh, to sparse rewards. So a reward function that uh, assigns a reward of one if your robot succeeds at some task, uh, and a reward of zero if it like falls, falls down or, or doesn't succeed. Um, but this can be pretty inefficient. So the robot is only getting a signal if it succeeds. Uh, and so initially, uh, there's not a lot of uh, kind of learning uh, signal. Uh, and so it might take lots and lots of iterations to, to converge to, to something good. Uh, so in practice, providing non-sparse rewards, like choosing the reward function uh, to provide more signal even when the robot fails, uh, can lead to more uh, efficiency. Uh, in this paper, they use a reward function that's a weighted combination of nine different terms. Uh, so there's a collision uh, term, so that's the, the second from the, the bottom, uh, so the number of uh, collisions, uh, the amount of time that the, the feet uh, of the robot are, are in the air, um, and a bunch of other terms that have to do with uh, the amount of joint torque that you're applying, so you're trying to minimize the amount of torque, uh, you're trying to do well in terms of how well the, the velocities uh, track, and, and so on. Question? Uh, hand tuning. So yeah, I guess someone, probably a graduate student or a team of graduate students, uh, spent a bunch of time uh, <laughs> coming up with uh, good good weightings for this. I mean, some of this can be automated. Like you can uh, try a bunch of weights and, and see what what uh, works well. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's a fair bit of uh, kind of uh, effort, uh, manual effort that uh, that goes into this as well. Um, and the, the final, uh, I guess, ingredient uh, is uh, a way to transfer from simulation to reality. Uh, so we saw that all of the, the training was done in the, uh, the simulator, this Isaac Sim uh, GPU-based simulator. Uh, but ultimately, of course, we want the thing to, to work well uh, on the, the hardware. Uh, so how can we ensure that the policy you learn in Sim actually transfers to the, the real world? Uh, so one pretty popular approach is what's known as a domain randomization. Uh, the idea here is fairly straightforward. So in simulation, you randomize uh, a bunch of different properties. So you can randomize the terrain, you can randomize uh, friction properties, you can randomize uh, different other like physical properties like masses, uh, inertias, and so on. Uh, and then you train uh, in sim with these randomized parameters. Uh, and the hope is basically that if your policy in sim is robust to these different uh, kind of variations of different parameters, uh, then the reality uh, is just some kind of uh, particular instantiation of this randomness that you saw in sim. Uh, and so the policy you saw in SIM will work in, in reality. Uh, there's not much uh, theory necessarily behind this. This is kind of an empirical thing. Um, and yeah, in this paper, they randomize friction, the amount of sensor noise, uh, they add random perturbations. They actually like poke the, the robot, uh, like perturb the, the robot, like push the robot uh, randomly. Uh, and that's supposed to uh, make the, the learned policy uh, robust uh, such that it can transfer uh, to the real world. Uh, and yeah, I guess with these ingredients, they're, they're able to, uh, to kind of get uh, uh, the different uh, behaviors that you saw over here. Um, so this one in, in particular, I think, is interesting because I don't think they had movable uh, objects in the simulator. Uh, but by randomizing other things, you're kind of getting robustness to, yeah, to this kind of uh, um, uh, phenomenon uh, as well. Uh, and just finally, I just want to emphasize that these ingredients, so domain randomization, good simulation, uh, reward shaping, and so on, are not specific just to locomotion. Right? I just chose that paper just to make things concrete. Um, here's a, a different uh, domain. So this is uh, robotic manipulation. Uh, this is OpenAI's Rubik's Cube uh, solving system. Uh, this is just a two-minute video, and, and then we'll uh, end. Oops, sorry. We're trying to build robots that learn a little bit like humans do by trial and error. 
what we've done is train an algorithm to solve the Rubik's Cube one-handed with a robotic hand, which is actually pretty hard even for a human to do. We don't tell it how the hand needs to move the, the cube in order to get there. The particular friction that's on the fingers, how easy it is to turn the faces on the cube, what the gravity, what the weight of the cube is, all of these things it needs to learn by itself. The interesting thing is that kind of standard techniques in robotics haven't been able to scale to that complexity that we see in a robotic hand. Humans have evolved to be able to manipulate and operate our hands. So there's a huge amount of learning that's happened through evolution to get us to this point as a, as a species. And the robot has to learn all of this from scratch. Instead of trying to write very dedicated algorithms to operate such a hand, we took a different approach where we create thousands of different simulated environments and learn to do the task in all of those and hopefully the robotic hand will be able to do it in the real world as well. This means like thousands of years of experience that this neural network has had in simulation. Every time the algorithm has gotten good at the task, we make the task harder. That's really crucial because it needs exposure to really complicated environments in order to eventually be robust to the real world. You put a rubber glove on the hand and it can still carry out the task. This ability to generalize to new environments feels like a very core piece of intelligence. It really changes the way we think about training general purpose robots. Moving from thinking too much about the actual algorithms and start thinking about how do we create complex enough worlds where they can learn. At some point, then it would be more down to the imagination what robots could actually accomplish. The hope is to build robots that can do many different tasks to increase the standard of living and give everybody a better life. All right, so yeah, I guess just to, to end, uh, if you're interested in, in learning more about uh, RL, I put some references here. Uh, so the first one is a textbook. This is kind of the, the classic uh, textbook in RL. If you want to start, uh, that's probably the, the place to start. Uh, yeah, there's a, a few other uh, resources as well. So an intro to deep reinforcement learning uh, has a kind of nice uh, summary of uh, techniques specific to, to deep RL. Uh, there's a course at Berkeley, which I also recommend. They have uh, video lectures, notes, assignments, and so on. Uh, so if you want to dig really deep, uh, that's another good resource. Uh, OpenAI is uh, spinning up, has a bunch of tutorials in, in DeepRL. Uh, that's another good way of kind of getting started in a, in a hands-on uh, way. Uh, any questions on, on any of this? Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the thing that happens, so the policy gradient method that I described, uh, so the thing that would happen in uh, parallel uh, are the capital N rollouts, like getting the trajectories from a particular policy. Uh, so you fix your policy, uh, you run it capital N times, uh, and that uh, computation can happen in parallel, and then you kind of collect the results, estimate the gradient, and then update. And the update is kind of a centralized thing, and then you parallelize again, and then you update. Yep. Good, other questions? All right, I'll see you on Thursday.